You know, I think even if you were to, again, go back to the Greek story of uh, Icarus, I mean, it's, you know, the Greeks are interesting people, but you begin your life as a horse. I don't know if you've seen horses or stallions. They are beautiful, majestic animals. You know, when they walk, everybody looks at them. You, know, you may have wings as a horse, but why the heck would you want to leave walking for flying? You have all these attention. <laughs> People ride you, they take you to places, you know. It takes a very, very, very special Pegasus horse to come to realize that, you know, I want to see if these wings actually do anything for me. I mean, if you want to know the gradual process of how welding takes place, you know, and the horse Pegasus doesn't just say, let me just play with my wings. You know, you have something biting the horse. So there is an external force. You know, it's like you're in this marriage. There's nothing wrong with it. There is just no passion, no love in it. All of a sudden, someone walks into your life and metaphorically bites you. For the first time, you feel the pangs of passion. And you say, damn, I've been in this relationship for 10 years. I've never felt this. Now, if the biting goes away, you will forget in time. It's not a problem. But if you have a Socrates who keeps biting you and biting you, your marriage is not going to last. You know, there comes a point where this horse gets bitten so much that it begins to jump you know how difficult it is for this horse to say, I want to fly, I no longer want to walk. You've been walking for the past 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You know, there is a good amount of security. I mean, horses are attractive. So, you know, if you have an attractive mind, and if you have the ability to speak, if you have an attractive face, if there is anything attractive to you, you will not fly, you will walk. Because people give you value. Once the horse flies and realizes there is a good amount of freedom in that, and they get to experience things they've never, when they walk, the horse says, you know, I don't want to walk anymore. I don't care about people. I don't care about anything that lives down there. Now, that horse better hopes that the Socrates that's sitting, you know, on him, has the energy and enough life to keep biting. It's a two-way street. First, the horse has to say, I want to fly some more. If the horse says, I want to fly, and Socrates says, I have a toothache now, I, I no longer want to bite, I don't care, the horse eventually is going to land. He can't do this on his own. If Socrates wants to bite, but the horse says, I miss walking, I miss my friends, I miss this, I miss that. Socrates has no power. There comes a point where Socrates bites with the permission of the horse. Where he's flown so high that he feels the warmth of the sun. 
he is unwelded to the earth. He is welded to an experience, but the horse doesn't see the destination. He has no idea what waits for him. It may be nothing. There comes a point where Socrates comes to realize that there is really no longer any need for him to keep biting. He has welded certain components inside this horse, Pegasus, that knows that should the horse ever desire to go back down, he'll feel so bad that he'll probably just kill himself. And the horse at this time has experienced the sun, so it goes all the way up. Until the horse is completely transformed, he becomes Icarus. That's how welding takes place, Cassie. Lots of time, lots of pain, lots of intimacy. And the destination is never clear. You're always blind. There is this kid who plays piano. His name is, I think, Peter Buka on YouTube. He's from Hungary. Um, he's been posting his, you know, his craft on YouTube for about five, six years now. He's a nice looking guy, but he's not an empty nice looking man. He's a man who knows his craft and performs his craft really, really well. I love the way he plays the piano and every time I sit and watch him, you know, these are like five, sorry, like two minutes here, three minutes there. I become so envious of him. I don't know if his parents were musicians or not, but he has a brother who plays the violin. He has a sister who sings, you know, opera. Let's just say his parents are not musicians, but. <clears throat> Maybe his father and his mother, they lost their parents in an accident, a car accident. And it grieved them profoundly. And they realized that, well, she's pregnant with Peter. And she's come to realize how short life can be. And they also kind of look at their own lives and they realize it's a complete waste. And they say, most parents desire to pamper their kids, give them whatever it is that they ask for. I don't want to do that. I want to give my kids something that will last them a lifetime. I don't care if it was toys. I don't care about birthdays. I will inflict a good amount of pain on them. I need him to learn how to play the piano. Now imagine if the parents don't have much money. <clears throat> now both go to work. They save. You know, they slave away so they can buy their kid a piano. And they do. 
but that's not enough. They need to find a teacher now. Now, the problem with kids is that they're kids. By default, it makes them stupid. They like to play. The idea of sitting somewhere for two, three, four, five hours, they're not going to do it. Now, the love that these parents have for their kid, <clears throat> it shows itself through a lot of yelling and perhaps hitting. A good amount of, at least on the surface, it looks like violence, but it's guided. It has a purpose. So he sits and he plays every single day for five, six hours. Now some people, they come to an age where they say, my parents can no longer force me. They walk away from it. <clears throat> some people, and I don't know how that happens, they fall in love with the instrument. Now that's, that's the key. That's the, like the welding component. You know, it's kind of like what Shams said to Rumi about his father. You know, Rumi's father had written some books, and Rumi enjoyed reading his father's books. And eventually Rumi says, My father is very knowledgeable, <coughs> but he has no love inside him. But he can't transform knowledge into something that's alive. That knowledge doesn't infect anybody. You should YouTube this kid. It's really, really good. If you don't like, you know, what he plays, you can just look at him. He's a good looking man. <laughs> you know, my, uh, you've met Arman and Kiana. They both, you know, were. Had, I think piano teachers but there they came a time when they said I just don't want to do it anymore they still play a little bit here and there <coughs> but they never fell in love with the instrument my brother's son Sarush he plays <coughs> and he plays really really well he still has a teacher who goes to their house and teaches You just, have, you just have to wait and see whether or not Sarush will eventually fall in love with piano. If he falls in love with piano, everything else in his life will become secondary. Piano will be primary. If he doesn't fall in love with the piano, he'll have the knowledge of certain scores and how to play them and maybe he'll play them when life breaks him. You know, when a girl breaks his heart or, I don't know, he gets an F in a class, you know. But... You know, 
you can go to school and study philosophy. And initially what is given to you is a good amount of knowledge, information. At a certain point in your career as a student, you have to kind of say, you know, what is it about Plato that makes him write this way? You just have to become curious about that. And that curiosity has to make everything you've read irrelevant, because you want that that lives inside him. And you have to fall in love with that. I don't know who can give that to you. <laughs>